Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to everyone. At the onset, I'm glad to deliver a keynote speech at the 8th International Conference on Cities, People and Places on the theme of Cities in Distress, COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on cities. The rapid urbanization has appeared as an inevitable consequence of the globalization. The cities have now become the primary habitant of humankind. More than half of the world's population already lives in urban centers. This development is compelling the urban environments to be increasingly dense, crowded and congested despite the often limited resources. However, recently outbroken COVID-19 proved to be affecting the urban habitants more than anything else due to very reason of difficulty in the segregation of the population and inability to comply with the so repeated social distancing. This means that the COVID-19 has attacked the very concept of the city. Therefore, a new constraint has been added to the city managers uh, and a new check dimension has been added for future urban city planners. As it's proved by the recent records, the most number of COVID-19 patients in Sri Lanka have been found from Colombo, Gampaha and Kalutar districts which consists the most crowded cities in Sri Lanka. Therefore, it is vital to understand the special and democratic factors of the pandemic spread and the situation of Sri Lanka that we have understood during the battle against COVID-19 before speaking the way of future living in cities. I have included, uh, I think, some of the photographs in my PowerPoint presentation collected from abroad uh, around the globe for better understanding. Firstly, the population density. In Colombo, Gampa and Kaltara districts, there are many po population pockets with very high density. At the initial outbreak, we discovered around 60 families living in 20 perch land in Keselwatha, that is in Colombo area. No limited, no limited to, not limited to uh, sharing uh, the walls. Most of them use common toilets and bathing facilities, making, making it impossible to segregate from each other. Therefore, it is obvious when one gets infected, he will carry the virus to the whole area. Sometimes, we happen to root ball the entire street and take them for quarantine since the quarantine at their own home was not at all possible. As you have already known, most of the persons in effect, in, infected with COVID-19 in uh, Palia Goda cluster, that is in the fish market, are from these high dense population pockets. Secondly, the common streets. In most of the populated areas in Colombo, streets are very narrow, making it difficult to separate the houses. Even the houses are separated the streets have become the common meeting, playing and marketing place. Also, the narrow streets do not permit to keep people separated and they have to use it as a solution to the limited space at homes. A pandemic may quickly spread in streets like this. Thirdly, the homes and the industries. As it happens everywhere in the world, the city life 
is to be spent amidst the industries and homes in limited space. However, if the industries, homes, shopping areas and markets are situated in different clusters with easy access to each other by appropriate transportation network, it is easy to segregate each cluster for managing situations. In contrast, in most of the cities in Sri Lanka, industries and homes are situated together in an irregular pattern, challenging the regular social activities whilst keeping the economic activity running. We experienced this situation very much in uh, the second wave in Gampa district. Fourthly, the amenities and services. In the city life, the services such as water is supplied from a single pipe, piping network. This would be one of the most vulnerable and possible conveyors of the next pandemic. Relatively, high rates of commodities in supermarkets and retail shops have compelled people to go for crowded markets for purchasing food and other commodities. Paleogoda fish market is a very good example of this. Further, there are limited recreational, relaxing, walking and cycling grounds in the cities of Sri Lanka, which make the places crowded and also vulnerable. Fifthly, the transportation and roads one factor making the city difficult to manage in a pandemic situation is the transportation system. We are lucky as Sri Lankans to have a very good road network and transportation system in our cities. However, the lack of exclusive transportation for different institutions and often crowded public transportation may lead to the spread of the virus easily. Whilst private transportation is not affordable for all, the overcrowded public transportation always adds risk. The sixth point is the temporary and working only population. As we are employee experienced, the accommodation of the staff of an institution who do not uh, permanently reside in cities is fulfilled in terms of boarding houses, rented apartments, annexes, etc. Most of these accommodations are on sharing basis with the common sleeping, bathing, cooking and specially lavatory facilities. This is one of the biggest challenges we faced in the second wave of the COVID-19 outbreak. Also, these workers are from all parts of Sri Lanka who could be carriers of the pandemic from cities to another area as well. Finally, and most importantly, the discipline of the people. Keeping all the previously mentioned factors at optimum, and perfect condition, an individual can make a havoc in a pandemic. We have ample examples of what happened in all over the globe during COVID-19 pandemic. The single reason for spreading the virus in well-placed or well-planned cities is the behavior of the people. However, the feared construct, uh, construction of urban life after COVID-19 will be temporary and soon be fed with the control of the virus, a vaccine or medicine is invented or people get the hard immunization, uh, herd immunization uh, at the worst. The current pandemic is just a reminder to have cautious living in the city. During the Atomic age, cities suddenly became hot. 
glowing targets promoting an urban decentralization. The 9-11 attacks prompted fear of skyscrapers and black death uh, decimated the cities in Europe during the Middle Ages. And in Asia, all the, all the way up to the start of 20th century, the pandemics were unique, little, I, I would say the quite often. The Spanish flu of 1918 killed as many as 50 million people worldwide. However, the population did not leave the cities. Thus, the cities will survive the COVID-19 as well. The truth here is that cities have been epicenters of the disasters since the time of Romans and they have always bound back often stronger than before. We do not know how the next calamity would look like or what the career of next pandemic would be. We don't know how it's going to be in the future. It may be water, air, food, creatures or anything. Therefore, we should not frame the future living only to prevent COVID-19. Also, it is unlikely that the fear of disease become the new normalcy in future. Therefore, the vision for the future city life would spin around new normalcy, underpinning, uh, underpinning uh, workability, life, pleasure, travel, association, while safety and health is one factor, but not the only factor. Therefore, rather than physical control measures, it would be more reasonable to promote behavioral changes in future. In uh, military theories, the method that has proven the victory against the enemy will revolve around three aspects. Finding the enemy, fixing the enemy and striking him to render ineffective. If we apply the same to the COVID-19 enemy or any other pandemic, the method could be identical. First, we need to find where are the in infected people and source of breakout. This is what is done through contact tracing and testing. Then we need to fix or contain the virus so that it would not further spread which is done by a quarantine process, travel restriction, social distancing and curfew. Finally, the disease has to be stricken, which is done through medicines and breaking the chain of spread. Therefore, it is wise that the future control measures also be done in support of these three aspects. With that, I'll speak on a few control measures or changes in the way of living that would be. Anticipated in the near future. Firstly, digitizing of personal details. Having the details of persons in a digital database is highly advantageous in many aspects such as tracing the contacts, flow of information recording, of travel history, etc. Also, the system would ideally be enhanced with face and eye recognition technologies, tracing of mobile phones and ID cards, etc. Such systems are evolving by now. Secondly, digitize, digitalization of uh, retail sales and services. One major issue we encountered during the initial breakout of the pandemic was the lack of a home to home service of food, medicine and sanitary facilities. Also, there had not been many online marketing system that could reach 
nooks of crowd population pockets promoting the cash sales online ordering and online banking and payment methods will be essential control measures in the future also since the city dwellers usually spend a busy life this online system will be a workable and practical way of managing the population and keeping them separated thirdly promoting remote consultations lectures medical advising and virtual business underscoring the least personal contact by now we have adjusted to new remotely working habit via zoom technologies teleconferences virtual learning etc this may be continued as a controlled measure and we may see an increment of such remote facilities in future fourthly regularizing public and private transportation public transportation would become the last resort for many institutions since the institutions suffer, suffered heavily due to non availability of transport when the institutions were allowed to function amidst the quarantine curfew however resorting to complete personal transport is not possible considering the way the considering the heavy traffic loads uh, and affordability but public transportation which is usually overwhelmingly crowded needs to be suppressed the future control measures will include promoting exclusive institutional transport staff service etc fifthly regularizing the accommodation of institutional workers as we experience in the minuangoda the second the second wave first cluster most of the factors most of the factories that did not have exclusive accommodation and were living in shared boarding houses the consequences were spreading the virus from one factory to many others as we all know the economy of the country runs on these factories and it is not possible to keep them closed for a long time the remedy would be promoting the provision of exclusive accommodation and transportation the sixth fact is learning from the past it can be expected that the healthcare systems community leaders and public government officials would excel at disease preparedness response and mitigation and learning from covid 19 also intelligence communication emergency reporting mechanisms and awareness sharing between different institution will be established as control measures in future we would develop and promote best practices as our core values for keeping environments safer and resilient the most important aspect that i would highlight is the managing of densely populated habitants of our cities difficulty to segregate these people from each other due to the limited space common usage of amenities and contiguous nature of the houses will be the same difficulties we face in the future too if we do not address the issue soon therefore a long lasting solution for hazard free cities mostly lies in the city planning rather than city managing therefore if we all are to imagine a pandemic proof city with millions of people without spreading the next pandemic in the future city planners need to seriously look upon some aspects so that they are practical and also it is affordable first we need imagination and vision to transform slums streets and crowded retail markets 
and bring about the safer, more accessible and more resilient habitant in that identification, control and prevention of disease is possible. Also, the fundamental planning guidance may be implemented to gradually thin out the slums and have more dispersion. There are enough examples of how city planning and design theories, concepts, regulations and practices have evolved historically in response to public health uh, crises, including pandemics and population with rapid industrialization. Second, it is required to be designed cities ensuring some of the fundamental needs of the population pockets. There are many people lacking access to adequate, affordable and secure housing and associated facilities. Without a house, it is impossible to impose laws to stay at home. Without a safer shelter and accessible basic services, the order to confine into certain place has no meaning. The COVID-19 is a good reminder for us to address the fundamental requirements and living spaces for the people at slums. Third, population clusters. Segregation of high dense population into several population clusters with adequate space, parks, community gardens and other natural areas within the cluster are essential to keep people within a specific area. If these facilities are remote from the living places, it is difficult to restrict the people into zones. Therefore, designers and decision makers should aim to develop simple, relatively inexpensive strategies to augment the usability of nature, make, nature making, uh, it's possible for city dwellers to enjoy life while respecting distance guidelines. Finally, as key takeaways, I would suggest few uh, fix that may be checked when developing planning and managing the cities which I believe essential in ensuring safe resilient and pandemic-proof city. First, provide adequate home, space, recreational, medical and other amenities within the proximity of a population clusters. Second, avoid mixing of population and gatherings unless otherwise absolutely necessary. Third, adjust the living and working environment so that health and hygiene measures can be practiced and implemented. Fourth, shift the vital economic installations away from the population hubs. Fifth, substitute obsolete congested living and trading buildings and other infrastructure with planned state of art structures. Six, sixth, share the necessary information between different levels of planners. Seventh, stop unplanned city building and adhere to a master plan. Eighth, support the attitude and behavioral changes of the population by adopting a comprehensive city planning so that the next crisis would be more comfortable to manage. Last but not the least, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Janaka Vijay Sundara, Dr. Chandrasekhar and uh, his team and also the Faculty of Architecture of University of Morotua for organizing this virtual conference, also for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to connect to this forum. I wish the conference to be highly successful 
and may you all succeed in all future endeavors. Thank you.